Today we're going to look at something called the division algorithm, which classically goes at the very beginning of a number theory class, or you might learn it also in, in an introduction to proof writing class. But the real reason we're looking at it here, because it's like a nice example of how mathematicians very carefully look at something that most people just take to be true. And in fact, this is something that a child in the fourth grade might learn, but it's kind of translated into a more mathematical setting. Okay, so anyway, let's get to this statement. It says, for all natural numbers a and b, although this can be easily extended to the integers, but we won't do that. There are unique q and r, which are non-negative integers, satisfying the following equation. We have a equals b times q plus r, where r is between 0 and b. It is allowed to be zero, but it is not allowed to be B. And this number Q is known as the quotient, whereas this number R is known as the remainder. And the fact that R is known as the remainder gives us an idea of why we have this bound here. Because you would never want a remainder which is larger than your divisor. And B here is playing the role of the divisor. Okay, so here are some examples. So on the left of this chart, I have like what you would write, maybe write down if you were in grade school, whereas on the right of this chart, I have it translated into this division algorithm setup. So 14 divided by 3 is 4 remainder 2, and that's because we can write 14 as 3 times 4 plus 2. Next, 37 divided by 11 is 3 remainder 4. That's because 37 is 11 times 3 plus 4. And then finally, 96 divided by 12 is just plain old 8. Well, remainder 0, trivially. That's because 96 is 12 times 8. Okay, to really hammer home like the care that mathematicians put into things, we're actually going to prove this statement. And then we're going to look at some examples of how this idea of division with remainder is useful in more advanced mathematics. Okay, so anyway, let's look at this proof. So let's consider the following set. So we'll set A equal to all numbers of the following form, A minus BQ, such that Q ranges over not all non-negative integers, and this quantity here is a non-negative integer itself. So maybe we could do that by just intersecting this whole thing with the set of non-negative integers. Okay, so I think that looks pretty good. Now maybe we could write this out to get an idea of what's going on here. So we have A equals, so it'll start with just the number A. So that would be like A minus B times zero. And then next we'll have A minus B, A minus two B, A minus three B, and then so on and so forth. And then we're intersecting this with non-negative integers. Great. The important thing to notice is that since A and B are natural numbers by our setup, this is most definitely the largest element of this set because here we're subtracting B. That's gonna give us something smaller. Here we're subtracting 2B. That's also gonna give us something smaller, so on and so forth. So this first set that I have right here which I'm underlining in brown, has no smallest element. That's because it keeps going down, right? A minus 3B, A minus 4B, A minus 5B, and so on and so forth. Whereas this thing over here has the smallest element for sure, and the smallest element here is the number zero. So putting all of this together, we see that A is a subset of the non-negative integers. And that's because we've got that intersection over there, which is like underlined in purple. Okay, but then the non-negative integers are bounded below. Well, they're bounded below by zero. That means A is bounded below by zero. But then any subset of integers which is bounded below has a least element. That's known as the Archimedean principle. Maybe it's a slight generalization of the Archimedean principle, but I think that's kind of okay. So let's say that A has a minimum 
we'll call it R, which is NA. Great. And then let's take Q such that um, R equals A minus B times Q. But then moving some things around, we'll see that A is equal to B Q plus R as needed. And now immediately, because of the fact that R is in A and A is bounded below by zero, that tells us that R is bigger than or equal to zero. Now we have to show that R is also strictly less than B. And so let's do that by way of contradiction. So by way of contradiction, let's suppose that R is bigger than or equal to B. And then we can write R as maybe B plus R prime, where R prime is bigger than or equal to zero. And I guess maybe clearly R prime is less than R. Okay, great. And now let's take this version of R here and we'll write B plus R prime instead of this version of R equals A minus B times Q. But that means we can write R prime as A minus B plus one times Q. But that's problematic because that's also within our set where it is smaller than the minimal element of our set. So obviously nothing can be smaller than the minimal element of our set. So we've reached a contradiction. So what did we contradict? Well, we contradicted the possibility of R being bigger than or equal to B, which means we can extend this inequality here to zero is less than or equal to R, which is less than B as needed over here. So we just proved the existence of these numbers Q and R. Now let's prove the uniqueness. Hey guys, I'm Justin, and I'd like to ask you to consider subscribing to the channel. Me and Michael are working really hard towards reaching our goal of pi 100,000 subscribers by the end of the year, and I believe that we can do it. Thanks for all your support and enjoy the video. So we'll prove uniqueness by starting out that we have two expressions like this and showing that those are actually the same expression. So let's suppose we have Q1 and R1 and Q2 and R2, where zero is less than or equal to R1 um, comma R2, which is less than B, and we have A equals B Q1 plus R1 and A equals B Q2 plus R2. R2. And now what we'll do is we'll subtract these two equations. So let's see what we get when we subtract these two equations. We'll have B Q1 minus Q2 um, plus R1 minus R2. So something like that. But now notice that that tells us that R2 minus R1 is equal to B times Q1 minus Q2. But now let's go up here and notice because R1, R2 are between zero and B, that means that R1 minus R2 is strictly between negative B and B. So it can't be equal to negative B and it can't be equal to B, again, because of that setup right there, it's strictly between those two numbers. But now let's take this inequality, which we derived up here and put B times Q1 minus Q2 inside. So let's see, that's gonna give us minus B is strictly less than B times Q1 minus Q2, which is strictly less than B. But then dividing by B gives us negative one is strictly less than Q1 minus Q2, which is strictly less than one. And then we recognize that the difference Q1 minus Q2 is an integer. So what we've done is shown that Q1 minus Q2 is on the interval minus one to one, but then it's also inside the integers. So it's in that intersection. But there's a single element within this intersection and that's the element zero. So that means that Q1 minus Q2 is zero, which tells us that Q1 is in fact Q2. Then we could maybe loop that back up into this equation right here and we'll see that that means that R1 equals R2. But that means that if we tried to have a non-unique expression like this, then we failed. And so that means our expression must be unique. 
Okay, so now let's look at some examples of where this shows up in higher math. Okay, so our first example is a little bit of a calculus example, and this is generally given as an exercise in a lot of Calculus 1 classes or differential calculus classes. And here we're going to find the 3215th derivative of the sine function. And we're going to use the following fact, which is pretty easy to check, and that is that the fourth derivative of the sine function is just the sine function. That's because the first derivative is cosine, the second derivative is negative sine, the third derivative is negative cosine, and then it loops back to being sine. Okay, great. And now we're going to take this number, 3, 2, 1, 5, and divide it by 4 and write it with quotient remainder. So let's see. Let's do a quick, like, grade school calculation here. 4 divides into 3, 2, 1, 5. So it'll go into 32 8 times, and it'll go into 15, let's see, 3 times. That's a 12, remainder 3. Okay, so that means that we can write 3, 2, 1, 5 as 803 times 4 plus 3. Okay, great. But now that means that what we really have is the third derivative of the fourth derivative applied 803 times. But if the fourth derivative applied one time is just the sine function, then the fourth derivative applied two times is also the sine function. And the fourth derivative applied 803 times is also the sine function. So that means that this guy right here has no effect. So this is essentially the identity operator on the sine function. That leaves us with the third derivative of sine, which we previously said was minus cosine. And then our second example, which we won't prove, we'll just provide some examples, is that A is congruent to B mod N if they have the same remainder when dividing by N. That's an if and only if statement, which means we could take that as the definition for this congruence mod N. So for example, 15 is congruent to one mod two. That's because if you divide 15 by two, you get a remainder of one. Then next, 34 is congruent to 2 modulo 8. That's because if you divide 34 by 8, you get a remainder of 2. Then maybe let's do one more. So 99 is congruent to 4 modulo 5. That's because if you divide 99 by 5, you get a remainder of 4. So in fact, although generally a different definition is given for congruence mod n within textbooks, in practice, you use this equivalent formulation to do your reduction as it's just a little bit easier to do on the fly. And if you've liked this video, I've got a lot of other videos on number theory, in particular congruence mod n on the channel. So maybe click the one on the screen right now if you're interested. And that's a good place to stop.